All right, hello everyone and welcome to our fourth of our spring webinar series. Um, this one is established colonies preparing for swarm season. So our goal tonight is to talk to all the beekeepers who have really big hives and getting them ready to make sure that they know what to do and is completely prepared for swarming. And just an introduction, so I know some of you have sat in on our other webinars. Um, for those who haven't, tonight um, there'll be four of us talking. I'm Megan Milbrath. I'm an extension and researcher specialist at Michigan State University in the entomology department. And I also keep bees down in Jackson County. With us is Anna Heck, who is a research technician in the department and also um, runs our Sentinel Apiary program and our Michigan Pollinator Initiative, working on our Managed Pollinator Protection Plan. And she's also a beekeeper in the Lansing area, as is Dan Wines, who is our Bee Informed Partnership Technical Transfer Team member, who is based in Michigan, but works with commercial beekeepers in multiple states. Um, Adam and Grail will be joining us again tonight, and he is based in the Upper Peninsula. And he is an extension specialist focusing on the Heroes to Hives program and veterans programs throughout the state. And then Zachary Wong is the last member of our apiculture team. And he's not joining us tonight, but I just want to introduce you to everybody who kind of works um, in the entomology department on our apiculture programs and through extension, um, bringing you information about honeybees. So, the other webinars are posted or should be posted. You can find them on Facebook, but also on our webinar website, the pollinators.msu.edu. Um, it will also have, so it has the recordings. It will have an upcoming webinar, which I'll talk about. It'll have links to videos, any articles that we mentioned, things like that. It will all be posted on this website. You can also get to it by just searching for MSU beekeeping webinars. Um, and here's how you find it. So this is our main webpage, the pollinators.msu.edu. It has tons of stuff on there. We've been really putting a lot of effort to fill it out. Um, but to find the webinars, if you click on the beekeepers tab, and then you'll see over in the right hand side in the menu, it'll say MSU Apiculture Extension Webinars. All right, so we are going to do another one that is just a question and answer period. So um, like I said, this is our fourth webinar that we've done. So we've done two for beginners and two for people with established colonies. And we've had a ton of questions and the questions still come in through emails. And so we'd like to just have a time where we'll be able to sit and answer some of those questions, plus do a check-in. Um, a lot will happen this time of year between now and April 20th. Please note that you do have to register for the next webinar. It is going to be free, um, but it helps us have a little more security. So um, again, it'll be at that exact same website. Sign up for us and join us at um, 7 p.m. on April 20th. All right, so what we're going to cover tonight, it is all going to be about swarming and splits. So we're going to cover swarm biology, talk a little bit about swarm prevention, the timing and how to know when to make a split, and then we've got a lot of options for swarm control. So the idea is to have options for people who have never made a split, and then some options for people who have made lots of splits. So hopefully we can cover the whole range of the people that are coming in. All right, well I'm going to start us off tonight with swarm biology, uh, getting into kind of what the is the uh, Whole, whole biology around why colonies are swarming. All right, so why do honeybee colonies swarm? So the real main reason that colonies swarm is this is their opportunity to reproduce. Now, when we think about reproduction overall, when we're talking about bees, oftentimes we get hung up on the, the, in, the reproduction at the micro level. So the individual, meaning a queen lays an egg and from that egg, an individual is born. That is one form of reproduction. But when we talk about reproduction as a colony, what we're talking about is the overall production, reproduction of that entire colony. And so that reproductive unit is what we call a swarm that 
that basically goes on to create another colony, one colony turning into two. And reproduction is the main goal of any organism. So that is the whole way that, that organisms survive. And when we think about bees, and we've talked about this in past lectures, you can kind of think about them as kind of a, a like a 25 pound organism. They, they really are kind of a, a single unit um, when it comes to a colony level. And so this is the reproduction of that single unit. If you have a big colony this time of the year, it is going to swarm. It's not a question of if it's going to swarm. It will swarm. And your role right now, this time of year, is really to help facilitate that process of what they're going to naturally want to do. Now, you think about this and you're thinking, well, okay, well, if the bees naturally do this, why do we need to intervene in this at all? It's a, it's a natural process. Well, there's reasons why we care about swarms. Um, and, and, and those reasons kind of vary from, from ourselves to kind of more ethical uh, questions as well. So why do we care about swarms? Well, there's several reasons. One of the big reasons that we care about swarms as beekeepers is because that is money in lost bees. You've spent all this time getting these bees through the winter, you get into spring, and then you lose half of them to a swarm. That swarm is essentially another colony that you have lost. So there's money that's lost if you, if you allow your colonies to swarm. In addition, you're losing that honey production that goes along with having more colonies or, or robust colonies. So you're also losing your production uh, capabilities as well. In addition, um, oftentimes we, when we think about being a good farmer and, and you all as, as beekeepers need to realize that you are a, a part of agriculture, you are a farmer. And part of being a good farmer is making sure that your livestock is well taken care of and is not creating a nuisance for anybody else. So an example might be if you have, you know, a cow farmer, you know, that farmer, you know, if the cows are constantly getting out and blocking traffic, that becomes a nuisance for the community. Now, for you as a beekeeper, a swarm is oftentimes really viewed as a nuisance because they oftentimes end up in structures, you know, siding, um, things like that under the eaves of a house. And that is something that your neighbors are going to look negatively upon. So part of being a good beekeeper is caring about those swarms and making sure that they're taken care of and, and don't end up in your neighbor's, uh, you know, soft pit or something like that. In addition, um, these unmanaged colonies, once they are, they're out in the wild and they're basically, you know, a swarm going barrel, we could say, you know, that, that is also an unmanaged colony and can end up being a mite bomb um, that you're creating yourself. So you want to make sure that as we're working with these honeybees that we're managing them correctly, and the only way that you can do that is if they're in a box that you're working. And so that's one way, you know, you're not losing money, but you also want to make sure that you're being a good steward of bees as well uh, by not allowing the, these colonies to kind of just die due to, to my presence. In addition, you've got the ethics around all of this, bee survival, okay? A colony, a feral colony, a cluster like this, you know, that's out in the, in the, in the wild, for, for uh, lack of a better term, depending on where you live, but a, this swarm that is essentially clustered on this tree, this is a very vulnerable position to be in for a group of bees. You, you have to think of the fact that during swarm season, we're oftentimes still touch and go with freezing temperatures at night. And you can definitely see survival diminished when these colonies are out in these exposed areas. So that's something you also have to think of is that we care about swarms because we want these bees to survive. We don't want half of our bees to fly off and then die because of a frost the, you know, the next day or the next week because they haven't had a, found a location to, uh, to rehome uh, re at. Okay, so when we're thinking about swarm biology, we know a colony is going to swarm when we see swarm cells. And so you can see that on this picture. You see all of these big cells here at the bottom with all that royal jelly facing back at you. So when we, when we know a colony is going to swarm, uh, we see these swarm cells. And what we really should be asking ourselves when, when we're thinking about seeing swarm cells is what is really the cause of these, the, uh, the cause of the creation of these cells. So, so why are these cells actually being created in this situation that leads to a swarm? And we've got one more bullet point there. Coming on up. <laughs> All right, so what causes the creation of these cells? And we can go right on to the next slide. So what is always the trigger? Oh, we'll 
hop right back to that other slide. So what's always the trigger for queen cells? What is something that is always a trigger for queen cells? And we have to think about this from our own, from our own perspective. So it's obvious when we have emergency queen cells because the, the queen's been killed and her scent drops. And bees will start to make cells because th there, is, there is basically a lack of queen pheromone. So we're talking about pheromone here. There's really one of the main drivers. So going back to that, when we see an emergency cell, we know that that cell's being created because the queen is gone. She's, she's dead. When we're thinking about a supersedure cell, we have a queen who's failing and not laying as well, and so her scent drops. So that, that correlation between the amount of brood being laid and pheromone is, is right there. They, as there's more laying taking place, there's higher pheromone. As, as laying decreases, that pheromone decreases with it as well. Now we look at this big frame here, full of brood, and we think to ourselves, well, you know, that's just, that's an amazing frame of brood. I'm going to be really happy with all these bees that are going to hatch out of it, and I'm going to go to town. But you have to keep in mind that because these frames are completely filled with brood, that there is really no other space for laying to take place, and that's lowering the pheromone. So if we go to the next slide, you can basically think about this in a couple of different ways. One of them is that we see lowered pheromone because one of the things that happens is as we have that big frame that hatches out on that last uh, slide, all of those bees hatch out. You've got this huge increased workforce. And now that workforce is out foraging. And what are they going to be bringing back? They're going to be bringing back resources. And so we get this increase in nectar production. So more nectar coming in. And what that does is that this essentially creates this competition for space in the brood chamber. The queen's trying to find places to lay but while the colony is trying to find places to put all the resources it's bringing in. And because we have this huge, huge, robust population of bees that are bringing in all of this forage material, oftentimes the brood chamber can get what we call backfilled. And if you see, if you're looking at this picture, you can see where the comb is a little bit darker there and there's brood kind of surrounding it. If you look very carefully, you can kind of see a shininess in the bottom of those cells. That is backfilling. So there's nectar being stored in the brood chamber. Now with nectar is being stored, you have an increase in nectar, they're taking over the brood chamber, so they're storing, they're storing nectar where there should be eggs. You see a drop in egg production, and that equals a drop in pheromone, in pheromones being released at that point. So because we have this competition for space, and there's not all this brood being laid in here, that pheromone's gonna drop. In addition, as we see this increased amount of bees, so just so many bees in our colony, we're gonna also see that pheromone drop per bee. So uh, as we look at the ratio of amount of pheromone per bees, per, per number of bees present in the colony, the more bees you have with this, with this, with this uh, colony, the, the pheromone is essentially gonna be diluted. And so again, we get into a situation when there's just massive amounts of bees that essentially the pheromone is dropping at that point uh, because of that dilution factor. And so these lowered pheromone cues are going to be those triggers for swarming. This lowered pheromone cue really can also be thought of in terms of ages of the queen. So old queens are more likely to swarm because they are starting at a lower level of pheromone. So meaning that a queen that has essentially gone through a whole season of, of, of laying really heavily that queen, when she starts out the next season, is just going to start laying at a lower level than a fresh queen would. So the, the, that lower level of queen pheromone is already going to be there just because she's older. Now, when you think about that, that's a really important thing to think about because you already, as you are coming into the spring, that is already a disadvantage. You're already at a disadvantage for risk of swarming. Now, you're going to swarm regardless, but this is going to increase that, that cycle a little bit faster. This is one of the reasons that it's a best practice to requeen in the late summer, so that you have a fresh queen that's coming out of, the, out of the winter and that has not gone through a big laying period. So how old is an old queen? I'm saying an old queen, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I've read on the internet that queens can live for years. Well, I mean, that's, that's true, but productive queens are, are limited. So when we're talking about the age of a queen, we're talking about age being determined by production and not by days. And, and Megan has a great analogy around it. So when you, if you're a farmer, 
and you think about your equipment, say your tractor, you think about that tractor in usage hours, not in the, the, the number of years that you've owned it, but rather the amount of usage that you got out of it. It's, it's like the same thing with a queen. It's not how old she is, it's how much usage she's had, it's how much production she's put out. And a queen that has gone through a big spring buildup, meaning if you had a queen from last year that brought you through the entire season, brought you through that big spring buildup, brought you through that entire cycle of the, of the year through the winter, and now you're out into spring, she is an old queen. She has gone through a big buildup period at one point during her life, and she is not going to be product, as productive as younger queens. And so again, that is going to lead to a lower amount of pheromone just in the beginning, just from the get-go, uh, because she's just not as productive. All right, so swarm cells start when the queen scent drops in the hive, and this happens when there's nectar in the brood nest, and, and this is what we call back building, and when there's a huge increase in bees. So it's more likely that this is gonna happen if the queen is old. So you just have to keep that in mind, that if we have a queen that has been, that has been through a productive season, and she is considered an older queen, this is gonna be more likely to be the case. All right, so let's just kind of recap on what's happening in the hive right now. So incoming nectar is coming in at a fast, at a fast clip, and that's backfilling the brood nest. This prevents the queen from laying because there is literally a competition for space. The workers are storing nectar where the queen wants to lay. That results in a lower lowering of the pheromone and the trigger of the creation of queen cells. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a very systematic process. And when you think about it in terms of how these, these activities like backfilling are affecting pheromone production, it makes it much clearer as to why these things are happening. And we think about it in terms of the other swarm, uh, or I'm sorry, the other, uh, the other uh, queen replacement uh, procedures like supersedure or emergency cells that we, we talked about earlier. This makes a lot of sense because it is all getting back to pheromone. Now, once all of this happens, the colony waits. The cells are capped, those queen cells are capped, and the bees will literally wait. I mean, the queen's gonna literally wait until good weather to take, they really start to emerge. And what you see here in this picture, this little slit on the bottom of this queen cell, it's a really interesting thing. So during this time, because weather can be so dicey during this period of time, when we're talking about swarms and, and during the swarm period, the queen actually, if she is, if it, the weather is bad, she will not emerge and they will actually feed her through this small opening until good weather is, is available and then she will emerge. So a pretty fascinating thing that happens right there um, as the colony's waiting for that perfect day to make that swarm. Now, swarming and the whole concept of why the swarm leaves the hives, the decision-making processes that lead up to that, all of the signals that come up to that, this is all very beautifully put together in a book called Honey Bee Democracy by Tom Seeley from Cornell. If you are interested in the rest of this process, please, we encourage you to read that book. It's a very good read, um, pretty much approachable for anybody. So if you wanna learn more about what's happening after that swarm leaves the hive and what led up to those decision-making processes, Honey Bee Democracy is the book to go after. Wonderful, thank you, Adam. Um, there's one question related to um, what you just spoke about, and I'll keep some of the rest of them till we get to those sections. But Mary wants to know when is late summer in Michigan to requeen? So when when is that process when you're recommending people to requeen? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Usually, a requeening for our operation, we usually like to do in August, um, and that's generally goes along with kind of the whole idea of getting ready for winter. So pretty much all of our winter prep kind of starts right around the end of July, beginning of August, and that's when we'll start to think about requeening in our operation. And that's the same for me in Jackson County, but I feel like the, the boundaries are kind of after the summer solstice and before-ish Labor Day but keeping in mind of when your actual honey flows are, that's going to, to drive it. Absolutely. Yep. All right. I'm going to keep the rest of the questions till the end, unless any came in over Facebook. 
Let me check our Facebook feed real quick. I think we are good on the Facebook page. Okay. And then a couple more came in. Um, so Phil wants to know, he's heard that some bees genetically swarm earlier than others. And how does this relate to pheromones? Do you want to take that or do you want me to field it? Go ahead and field that, Megan. Um, so one, there's definitely that some bees do swarm earlier than others. And a lot of times with a lot of behaviors that are different from genetics, what is usually going on is that they just have different thresholds. And so like you can picture it, um, one analogy that I've seen is humans who feel that their house is dirty at different levels. Like one person can't handle having one dish in the sink and the other person is fine having like tons of dishes in the sink. And so a lot of it is that they will just be sensitive to different levels. So it's still the same signaling, but they just get triggered a little earlier. And that's the same for like a lot of things like defensiveness and things like that. Um, another thing that's different is their relationship to how quickly they respond to incoming food. So some bees will build up brood a lot more quickly in the springtime and will have a much larger colony um, in the springtime. And so it's kind of how they respond to different um, food triggers in the environment. And then, um, so Adam, going back to queening, um, why shouldn't the beekeeper allow the colony to determine when a new queen is required based on pheromone level rather than have the beekeeper make an arbitrary decision late in the summer? Well, it's not really an arbitrary decision because when we think about it from that pheromone perspective, we are talking about getting yourself into a situation early in the season, the next, the following season where swarming is going to be more of a problem. Um, and so by preparing this, it's not really an arbitrary decision. We're making a calculated choice to ensure that we have a productive queen going into the spring that will allow us to have lots of pheromone going right into the spring. Um, so that, that it's really, it's not an arbitrary decision. It is a, it's a very calculated decision. I agree. And, and a big part of that calculation is, you know, the bees aren't necessarily going to do what's best for themselves sometimes, um, even though we, we like to, to picture that. And sometimes they're going to choose to requeen right in the middle of the honey flow. Or maybe that queen runs out of sperm, like right when we need them for the spring buildup. So the best chance for that colony is to have a young queen going into the most important time of the year. All right, and then the last question related to this topic is how can you tell the difference between a swarm cell and a supersedure cell? So really, when I think of swarm cells uh, compared to a supersedure cell, when you see swarm cells, they are just everywhere. I mean, all over the place. But the reality of the situation is, is that queen cells, you know, it's very difficult to tell the difference between many or between the, the different types of swarms that you will have uh, or our queen replacement that you will have. But overall, when I look at it, you know, when I'm looking for swarm cells, typically I see them on the bottoms of the frames. There's lots of them and that's usually a big indicator. But the other thing that you have to consider are what are the symptoms that you're seeing leading up to that? So things like backfilling and those types of things, those are, those are cues to tell you what kind of what kind of situation you're dealing with. And, and if those are swarm cells or if you're seeing emergency cells or something like that, you have to think about the fact that, you know, these are, these are situations that are happening that are, that are normal replacement procedures, but there are these symptoms that can cue you into what's going on. Excellent. All right, so I'm gonna go quickly into swarm prevention. For those of you who were with us last week, this is gonna be a little bit of a review, but um, I know there's usually new people in, so we wanted to talk about kind of what we're doing now at this time of year. So for when we talk about splits and when we talk about swarm prevention, we're only really going to be doing this on the big ones. Um, so what I'm doing this time of year is kind of looking through my colonies and getting a sense of how many are going to be likely to swarm. And this obviously can change in a couple weeks, but I'm going to kind of get a count of how many colonies are going to need swarm management. 
And it's going to be on the ones that are big. We usually talk about it in frames of bees. So these are going to be ones that are maybe over, you know, what the ones, this one obviously has many frames of bees, but also ones that have um, probably more than six frames of brood. All right, and we brought this up at the last meeting. The reason that we have to be so careful is that in our spring in Michigan is not a linear process. So we don't just get warmer, 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 and all of a sudden, well, oh, it's dandelions in their spring. We have full spring, and then we have second winter, and then we have the spring of deception, and then third winter, and then mud season, and then actual spring. So we want to make our splits in actual spring but pretty soon we are going to enter the spring of deception and you will want to do your splits here and you will be wanting to get into your hives and you will feel so excited and you'll see these big booming colonies and you'll go out and you'll just be like, oh my gosh, I have to split them. And you can see the sad face because if you do splits too early, one issue is if you're not managing queens, you don't have any drones for them to mate with. And we'll talk about all the options with queens. The second problem is that you can often get chilled brood because we get snow and we get really cold weather really late. And the biggest thing that limits growth for honeybee colonies is the amount of nurse bees that can keep the brood nest warm. And when you split a colony, you increase the surface area of that brood nest without increasing the volume of the bees, and you really put the bees at risk for chilled brood, which puts them at risk for stress-related diseases. And then finally, it's slower growth. So like I mentioned, um, they're, they're really warmth limited in the spring. So most of the bees are involved in nursing care. So if you split them, you make even a higher proportion of the bees involved in nursing care, and you really do get really slow growth. So we want to make our splits, we have better success if we can wait till actual spring. So an important part is to know when that's actually going to arrive. But I can tell you where I am, like I said, down in Jackson County, which is growing zone 5B, right around tax day, we get a really nice warm up. And then I just start to get tons of phone calls of people who are digging in their hives and wanting to make splits. And so if we can hold, like control ourselves and, but make sure that our bees have space and so that we can split later, we're going to be better. But during that time, um, we do have, you can bump ahead. So during that time, we do have nectar coming in and we wanna make sure that the bees have a place to put that nectar. The bees always wanna put nectar above the brood nest. And so um, if this is our overwintered colony, a lot of times at the end of the year, it's up near the top and it's not going to have anywhere to put nectar above the brood nest. And as Adam mentioned, if they will, um, don't have a place to put it, they're going to put it in the brood nest, which is going to start that whole process of backfilling, which is going to start the triggering of queen cells. So we want to give them space so that every little last drop of nectar that's coming in can go in. So if you want to click ahead. So one of the things that we're doing at this time of year, and this is basically for any colony that you're not feeding, as long as there's food coming in, is we can add newly drawn comb. And so this is what, like me personally, I'm getting frames ready to go out and do this for the next warm up because we have seen food coming in in my area. So it has to be drawn comb. Like I said, everybody's tied up in nursing care. They're not gonna be drawing wax. You can do it early as long as the colony is not feeding. They're going to want that space and it does give them a chance to clean up those frames. You can do it with honey supers as shown here. This is an all medium hive. Um, if you use brood nests, it doesn't matter if the bees go up into it um, because we're going to make splits later. This is just a process that's buying us time. Um, if you are using just honey super frames, you can put a queen excluder underneath if you don't want the brood to be going up there. So supering early is a thing you can do this time of year. All right, and, and again, this is not our final solution. This is the thing that buys us time. So we want to do splits and we want to do further manipulations um, with the brood nest, but we want to wait until it's warm enough that when we expand that brood nest, the bees can cover it. So on a nice day in April is usually when I add the supers. And that's once food's coming in, but before it's consistently warm. And I love, Dan took a whole series of really lovely photos of these flowers with snow on them that really like kind of capture this 
um, what we have. You know, so today where I am, it was warm, the bees were flying, but then we are going to go back to garbagey spring Michigan weather, and we are going to get more snow. Sorry, but it's true. And um, the bees are going to have to hunker and be really close again. So we want to make sure we're kind of prepared for both of these. All right, so I've got um, a couple questions. So one says, this is my first successful overwintered colony. How soon can I look in my hives to see if they're likely to swarm? So I'm checking the tops of the hives and seeing how close they are to the top and kind of getting a sense of how much food they have right now and um, how much space they kind, I kind of feel like they're going to have. I'm not digging down in the brood nest, but I probably will start peaking in a couple weeks. And so like I said, like I'm in one of the warmer parts of the state and I usually don't start digging in there till end of April. I want to make sure that the day that I'm actually looking in the brood nest is going to be a really warm day, but I also want to make sure that I'm just getting the information I need when I go in there. So I'm going in there, I'm looking to see if I'm backfilling and then um, that's it. So you can peak in, in the lid. Um, there's another question here that says, what if I don't have super frames with drawn out comb? In that case, you can still add them and have them out in the yard for your splits um, that are coming up, but you don't have the option this year to put early supers on and for it to be really useful. However, if you don't have drawn comb, then you absolutely have to be really, really focusing very, very heavily on getting comb drawn this year. Drawn comb is gold and that should be a top priority. All right, and then I'm going, there's one last question that's related to this and then it says, will under supering help prevent swarming? So what they mean by that is kind of putting boxes underneath the ones that are already filled. Um, in this case, all we're doing is putting boxes directly above the brood nest, but in theory, every time that you have, um, the bees will generally want to put nectar right above the brood nest. So as long as they have ample space to do that in drawn comb, then they will, um, that will help prevent swarming. All right, I'm gonna talk about split timing. So this is a question we get a lot. And the question is, when do we know when it's time to split? And the answer is pretty much how I answer most beekeeping questions, which is, it depends. So it depends on the strength of the colony, whether or not you're feeding that colony, and the weather. Um, so for example, if you have really strong booming colonies, those colonies might be ready to split before some of your average size colonies. Um, if you're doing a lot of feed, spring feeding, your colonies might have more food and be able to, ready to split sooner than otherwise. And the other big factor is the weather. So not only about like what kind of food you have in your area, but also is the weather allowing your bees to go out and find it. So the bees in the environment tell us when to split our colonies, not the calendar. So we want to do swarm control before we start seeing swarms. So one thing you'll want to think about if this isn't um, your first year beekeeping is when did you see swarms last year? Um, when did you start hearing about beekeepers having, losing their colonies to swarms or losing bees to swarms? Or when did you catch a swarm last year or hear or get a call about a swarm in your area? So check your notes and prepare to do uh, control a few weeks before you know swarms are really common in your area. Um, swarms are common during apple blossom and hardwood greening you want to try to split before there's a strong, consistent nectar flow. So your goal is to split your colonies before they swarm. Um, you also want to split your colonies before you see queen cells. So once you start seeing queen cells in your colony, it might be too late. Swarms typically leave when there are queen cells in the hive. So our goal is to split the colonies before you start seeing the queen cells. Um, so some beekeepers think that they can convince their bees not to swarm if they remove every swarm cell. So they think, ha, huh, I know what to do. I'll get rid of all the swarm cells and that'll 
commits my views, not to swarm. Um, but this is not a, a good strategy. There are a few issues with it. One is that it's nearly impossible to find every single swarm cell. Swarm cells can be tucked into frame crevices and really difficult to find. The other thing is the colony may have already swarmed when you notice the queen cells. And if you destroy the queen cells, then that you might make it impossible for your colony to have a new queen because the old queen would have left in the swarm and then you just destroyed all their chances of raising a new queen. Finally, swarm cells can be really nice cells. So instead of um, cutting them all out, maybe you have an opportunity now to do a split and make a small nuke. All right, so we can see when a colony is experiencing lowered pheromone um, and by noting the backfilling and when there isn't as much brood in the middle of the frames when you see more nectar, and that's a precursor to swarm cells. So what we wanna do is anticipate. Before we start seeing those swarm cells, we wanna know that our bees are getting prepared to start raising queen cells, and that's the moment where we want to intervene and do some splits. Okay. Um, so, we, so we can see when a colony is about to experience lowered pheromone when we have full frames of capped brood. So here are some nice, beautiful frames of capped brood. Uh, and this is an indication that our colony is experiencing lowered pheromone and that they might be preparing to swarm soon. We can also um, know that our bees are thinking about swarming um, when they, so they start getting prepared to draw a lot more comb. So when there's a full shift of brood, there's a shift about to happen, and many of the bees that swarm are prepared to draw new wax comb. If you're thinking about the swarm biology, the bees who leave need to draw a lot of new comb in order to build their new hive. So this colony looks ready to split. We see lots of sealed brood. I guess we only see a corner of the frame right now, but we're imagining a frame that's full of sealed brood and a lot of sealed brood and brood in this colony. Uh, we can see what we call frosting on the queen cups. So those queen cups there, um, they might not have an egg or a larva in them, but we, and normally we just call them queen cups if they don't have any brood in them, but we see frosting. So that's those little white flakes of wax on the queen cups, and those let us know that the bees are paying attention to those queen cups. So they're not raising queens in them yet necessarily, but they're preparing to, they're paying attention to those queen cups, they're putting new wax on those cups. So that's another indication that our bees might be getting ready to raise some queens. And then also, it, we might be seeing nectar in the brood nest area, and that's the sign of, again, backfilling, and that a colony is getting crowded and getting ready to swarm. All right. Any questions? Um, I have a couple questions that came in about um, doing reversals, and we didn't really talk about that, but um, so I do want to direct people to the webinar that we did last week because we talked about it at length, but Anna, do you mind just speaking briefly about using reversals as um, swarm control? Sure, so the idea behind reversals is that you're trying to give bees some drawn comb above the brood nest. The issues with reversals are that most colonies you'll find in a situation where you can't reverse the brood boxes without splitting up the brood nest. So if you have, you're in a situation where, for example, your hive that overwintered is in three deep boxes and you just have brood in the top two boxes, then you can do a reversal and move that bottom box with no brood to the top. But most of us are going to find ourselves in a situation where we have to break the brood nest and to do, to do a reversal. So we don't want to break the brood nest in the spring. Instead, um, one thing that Megan recommended or Adam earlier in this webinar is to put supers on top of your colony early. And that's a way to give your bees drawn comb above the brood nest and you don't have to worry about breaking up the brood nest. Awesome. And then there's another question um, about why we should not add an extra box to slow swarming if we're still feeding. Do you want to take that one too? Sure. So, um, so you can add an extra box, but really there's a, at a certain point your bees are going to be in, wanting to do that very productive swarm. And so you want to be prepared to split your colony regardless. Yeah, and part, part of it is just a physical issue. Like if you have a bucket feeder on the hive, you can't also put a box on there. But also they're kind of 
counter, you don't need space for incoming nectar if you're feeding. You know, if by, by definition, there's no incoming nectar if you're feeding. Um, and then the last one for you, Anna, should one remove queen cups when they are seen? So you, I don't, I think your bees are going to keep building queen cups regardless of whether or not you keep removing them. I would think that that would be kind of a futile effort. And I would, I would let your bees make queen cups because they like to have queen cups, but just really be prepared to split your colony before they start raising swarm cells and queen cells. Excellent. All right, if we don't have any more questions, I'm gonna take the next section on swarm control with no new queen. So we're gonna look at switching hives and this removing brood method as ways to control swarms. We did get one question uh, that came in, I believe after the last webinar about uh, moving splits. So do I have to move my split to a new location? And we get this a lot and there's a lot of really interesting ideas on, on how far you need to move a split. Um, the reality of the situation is no, you don't have to move your split to a new location. All of us who are on the, the call or the webinar today have done splits within a single apiary and you don't have to be considered about, uh, you don't have to be concerned about the fact that you need to move your split miles away in order for it take, to take. What you need to keep in mind is that if you, if you can keep this, if you're keeping the split in the same yard, you just need to account for the fact that all the bees that have oriented to the old hive will go back to the original hive. So those foraging bees that are out while you're doing your split, they're going to come back to that original hive because they're oriented to that. So the key here is, is when you're doing a split and you're keeping it at the same, in, the, in, a, in the similar location, giving them lots of extra bees to account for that fact. So just making sure that you give plenty of bees to that new split is a way that you can, you can alleviate that, uh, that problem. And, and no, you don't need to you know, haul your bees two miles down the road to do a split. You can do them right in your own single apiary. All right, so basic principles of swarm control. Number one, well, the queen needs space to lay. So we've talked a lot about, in this series in general, we've talked a lot about the value of drawn comb and how it's like worth its weight in gold. This is another example of why drawn comb is so, so, so important because that, the queen needs space to lay. And if you just give her a frame with foundation, that is not a place to lay. Drawn comb is a place to lay and you need that in the brood nest. Every resulting hive when you're doing swarm control, so if you're doing splits, the big things you need to keep in mind when you're doing this type of control is that those resulting hives need enough nurse bees so that they can cover the brood nest. And Megan had talked about um, chilling. So the brood nest actually chilling because you don't have enough nurse bees to cover that brood nest. You also need to make sure that whatever hives you have that result from these uh, measures have enough food. You always want to make sure that you're giving the resources necessary for these colonies to survive when you're doing these types of manipulations. In addition, you want to make sure you have a queen, a queen cell, or the potential for that colony to raise a good queen. So we're gonna give you a couple methods here on, on basic swarm control that doesn't require any new queen, okay? So the first one we're gonna look at is this switching hives technique. So we're literally gonna, we have two hives here. And what we're looking at is you've got this one on the left that is really robust, this big cluster that's covering two boxes. And you got this one on the right that's this small cluster in a single box. Now, what you can do if you have one really weak hive and one really strong hive, you can literally just trade locations with those two, thinking that the field bees that are out and have oriented to the location of one hive are always going to go back to that original hive. So if you move the original hive to another location and another hive to that location, those field bees will return to that new hive because it's in the same location as the previous. Now, if we can get a couple animations here, I think we've got here. Oh. There we go. So, so one of the things that you need to think about is we've talked about adding space. So you're always going to need space in these situations because you want to make sure that you don't risk the, the you don't start uh, getting those swarm impulses building up by lowering pheromones. So we're adding space here so that they can store stuff above both of these colonies. And then what do we do? We swap them. So we literally have swapped places with them. Again, the field bees that are out there that are foraging are gonna be coming back and they're gonna be joining our smaller hive now. 
That gives our, our smaller hive this boost and this increase in workforce. And our bigger hive, it alleviates some of the space pressure because we literally have decreased the number of bees in that colony. So we're able to, to kind of mitigate those swarm impulses by distributing these bees between these two hives just by switching location. So the next method that we have here is the removal of brood. So when we're talking about removing brood as a method of swarm control, again, it gets back to space, right? We're, all, we, we're always talking about this idea that space is becoming limited and that's causing pheromone to decrease. So one of the ways that we can do this is we can remove full frames of cat brood from that big colony on the left. So those big frames that we saw in those earlier pictures, and I've been seeing a lot of folks sharing pictures on Facebook that are down in lower Michigan that are seeing these huge frames right now. So you take those, those full frames that are, that are cat brood and you replace them with drawn wax in the, in the big hive. And you take those cat brood frames and you add them to the small colony or you can use them to make a nuke too. So if you wanted to make another colony and, and, and do that through the production of a nuke, you could do that at this point too. You wanna to keep those nurse bees on the frames though. So those nurse bees that are keeping, that are tending to that cat brood, it's important that they stay on, um, that they stay on with that, with that brood because you wanna make sure you have enough bees to cover that brood in order so you don't run into the, the possibility of chilling. Um, a, one thing you want to make sure, though, is that you don't take the queen, because essentially what you're going to end up with when you're done with all of this redistribution of, of brood is you're going to end up with two equally sized colonies. And you, both of these colonies are going to have queens. So even though we had the small colony, that was a, you know, it was a small colony, but it still had a laying queen. In both of these examples that we've showed you here, we have not added a queen at all. We've literally been just, just kind of addressing the swarm impulses by, re, by moving resources around or by moving colonies around so that those bees distribute. So it's an interesting way to kind of help uh, mitigate the swarm impulse and kind of get into a situation where you aren't going to have a swarm without actually ever having to use a new queen or introduce a new queen or even have them raise a new queen. Uh, these, are, these are good methods for, for approaching swarm control without, without having those resources as far as a queen is concerned. Do we have any questions on that section? Um, there's one question. It says, but the foragers are able to enter the weak hive with no issues. Won't the bees notice that they do not belong? So I think when you're doing the switch, um, we had talked about that the bees don't care. Do you want to talk to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I can expand on the fact that the bees don't really care. Um, so they have, so within that smaller colony, I mean, there is a whole group of bees that are, that are there, that are tending the colony, that are, that are there, that are cued into the queen. As those foragers come in, they, they really don't care. I mean, their, their responsibilities are really out in the field. They're not tending to the queen. They're not tending to the brood chamber. So um, they, they just really don't care. Yeah, I think I think you did that. I think that's one of the situations where the internet makes a bigger deal about it than the bees do. Um, one of the other techniques that we use a lot during the summer is just stacking a weak hive on top of a big hive, and the bees combine yep. much more readily than um, online people tell you that they do. <laughs> that's the truth, and, and we've got several questions on the Facebook page that are that are going towards this same thing about mixing bees from two hives, and yeah, it just doesn't matter. The bees are so much nicer than people give them credit. They're, they're, they're very welcoming. Okay, um, we'll talk now on, as say we've kind of gone through a little bit on alleviating some of the swarming by moving resources, either, either bees or brood around. Um, now we're gonna talk through some, some of the simplest methods of actually making new colonies, making splits to, um, you know, kind of, get at that uh, swarm prevention. Um, so when we make this first couple that I'm going to run through two different ways to make splits and both of them involve letting the bees raise a new queen. Um, we've talked a lot about swarm cells and what causes the creation of a swarm cell. Um, we're actually going to induce a situation where the bees create, beekeepers kind of refer to it as an emergency cell in the sense that all of a sudden the bees have realized we don't have a queen and that's because we as a beekeeper are going to perform an action that leaves one colony without a queen. Um, you know, th this happens in nature 
you know, different times. This happens as a beekeeper. When you accidentally squish a queen, you damage her, you work in a hive, something happens. Um, so the bees are prepared to make cells um, in this fashion. Basically to make those cells, they need eggs, um, they need young bees, and they need good, good nutrition and good health. So these cells you see around the perimeter of this nice sheet of brood, um, where they're, they're kind of protruding from that, those are what we call emergency cells. That colony's become queenless roughly a week ago and the bees detected that and, and made those cells. Um, so a couple just pros and cons of letting the bees raise their own queen with, with these methods we're gonna describe. You as a beekeeper, you don't need to find the queen. Um, you know, it's something you wanna certainly become proficient at, but Sometimes it can be difficult. Sometimes they just don't want to be found. So you don't actually have to find her for either of these two methods. Um, it's, they're both, they're cheap. You're not spending money for a queen and they're fast for, for the beekeeper. You're not spending that time looking for. And as, as we'll show you, there's kind of an automated recipe to, to do these two methods. Um, another potential pro is you are going to get a prolonged brood break that does give an opportunity uh, for varroa management, you know, with this uh, letting them raise their own queen, you're gonna have a couple weeks in your colony where there is no capped brood. So that's a good opportunity for varroa management. A uh, couple of downsides, um, queen mating is not always 100% successful. Um, we'll talk through a little bit on the process that has to happen. And another potential downside, depending on your objectives as a beekeeper, is there's gonna be an extended period where the colony um, does not have a queen in it. So its, it's growth is gonna be slowed down. Again, some beekeepers totally fine. Um, if production is your primary objective, then this may not be a, a method for you. Um, so just a brief timeline on reading, letting the bees raise their own queen. If we say day zero is the day when the queen is gone from that hive, and in this case, that's at our doing as beekeepers, we are removing the queen. Um, so in the first couple of days, the bees are, you know, I say now we not, we not just have diminishing pheromones. We have the pheromones are gone. The bees are going to pick up on that and they're going to take, um, you know, first in our very youngest larvae just hatched out from an egg. And they're going to, they're going to transition that from its worker diet to its essentially by feeding it royal jelly, they're going to put it on the, the queen development program. Um, so that happens within the first couple days. And then that virgin queen is going to emerge 12 to 14 days after that. It's going to be 16 days total from when that whatever egg that the bees select, it's going to be 16 days from when that egg was laid. But, um, you know, there's kind of, that'll be a couple days prior to when we've removed that queen. So after a couple of weeks, the, queen, the virgin queens emerged. The first week, she basically just settles in. She needs to eat and get her strength up, and she needs, you know, her wings need to harden and the muscles need to develop. Because after that week, she's going to go on a series of mating flights. Um, she'll mate with ideally, you know, 15, 20 drones. Um, she'll return to the hive and settle in and begin laying after that. But now, at, at this point, you know, we're, we're in the four weeks essentially after we've taken that queen out of that hive she'll start laying and then we're still a couple weeks three weeks really downstream from that the workers develop in 21 days so we're at a full kind of six to seven weeks after we've taken that split until we have new bees from that new queen emerging so i say that this is a a drawn out timeline so just something to consider um so the first method we'll run through is kind of called the walk away split or a quick and dirty split um, and so we start with this nice colony. Again, we're focusing on, we're gonna be splitting our strong colonies. Those are the ones that are gonna be prone to swarm. So here we have an overwinter double deep, nice big cluster, bees in both boxes. Um, and we're in this scenario, we wanna make sure we have, you know, we have good covering of bees, we have brood, we have eggs, we have food. That was kind of the recipe we need so the bees can make their own queen. So we wanna make sure we have that in each box. The queen somewhere in there, again, we don't need to find her. What we do need is we need to bring to the bee yard a couple extra boxes with frames and one extra bottom board and inner cover and lid. And then we're going to want to have some feed with us as well. Um, so to do this, you're basically just going to take the top brood box 
off and put it onto your new base. So that one's gone to the left and your bottom box of the original colony is gonna stay where it is on that existing base. And then you're gonna add a new box to each of those two new units that you've created. Um, best, best practice if you wanna even up the, the workforce is to kind of have each of those new colonies sitting kind of to the side of where the existing colony was and that will kind of give you a little bit of a split in the field base. Said they, they orient to that position. If you have one a couple feet to the left and one a couple feet to the right, they're going to kind of split and you'll end up with some field bees in both. Um, so basically, after you've done that, you've put your box of drawn comb on the top, you want to feed them and you want to put the lid on, and that's it. So we've done essentially, we're done now. As an option, this is again, I'm explaining the ways to do it without a queen. As an option, if you wanted to come back um, after four days you don't know where that queen is but if you come back in four days one of those colonies is going to have eggs in it and one of those colonies is not going to have eggs the colony that's got eggs it's got the queen close it back up leave it alone they're off and running the colony that does not have eggs you could plant your mated queen in that colony and that is say that that duration of four days allows any eggs in the original split now they progress past eggs so that's the way if you want to do it you can you can come back in a few days and easily determine where your queen went without laying eyes on it. The eggs will tell you that. So that is the walk away split method. Now we have another real easy split method. Again, what you're going to need here. So we're, this time we're, we're starting on the left and we have a nice strong double deep. Um, what we want to bring out to the bee yard, we want an extra base and a lid. And again, we want a couple empty boxes of frames boxes of frames, drawn comb, um, and we want feed again. So this, starting with our colony on the left, queen's somewhere in there. Again, we don't know where, but she's somewhere in there. And we're going to go through the top box and the bottom box, and we're just going to dot every second frame. Um, you know, so I've seen some beekeepers number them odds and evens. That's fine, too. But if you dot, you know, incrementally every, uh, every other frame. And then you're going to set your empty boxes on um, basically on two bases you've got and you're going to pull the frames out of them and you're going to start in the bottom box and all of those dotted frames are going to go into the middle of one box and the undotted frames are going to go into the middle bottom of the other box and by doing it that way they, they go in the order they come out so you keep the say you, you've got those funny frames the orange at the outside and your brood frames in the middle um, you'll keep that brood contiguous and tightened up like that. You'll basically do that twice in each, each, each of your two new units. And then you'll go through and repeat that process um, it, with the top box. You'll, you'll take your five dotted frames in order. You'll place them on top. Um, and oh, you'll want to fill in in your bottom boxes. You want to fill in alongside what you've transferred over. You want to fill that in with your drawn home. Repeat the process in the top. Again, we don't know where the queen went. It doesn't matter. One of those colonies is going to be off and running. It's still got its queen. They've got some space to grow. The other colony um, is not going to have a queen, but we've made sure by doing it this way, they have all the resources to produce a queen. Again, same as last time, if you wanted to come back in four days, you'll find the same thing. One of those colonies is going to have eggs. That's where your queen is. One of them is not going to have eggs. You could introduce a queen there if you wanted. Um, Basically, that's about it though. Th those are two methods that you can split colonies without purchasing a queen, without seeing a queen. You're just creating new units that's going to put their, their swarming um, verge at bay. Um, so again, this is what you're going to end up with is those two, two colonies. You see all your dotted frames went in one, the non-dots in the other. You've ended up, you've just narrowed, tightened up the brood nest but um, the bees should have space. Again, you could come back and add a super on top of those if you want to get some comb above. Um, but that's two very basic, easy methods um, that you can make splits without seeing your queen. Great. Um, so Dan, one of the questions is, Alicia wants to know, but how would you go through these processes if you only have eight frame mediums? Could you just explain kind of how that works? Sure, sure. So. Okay, and then you could imagine a scenario where you'd get into 
through a three box setup for, for the sake of uh, simplicity, assume you had four boxes. Um, you could take two of those for the first method. You could take two of those boxes and split them off. Um, what you want to make sure is that each unit has some brood. It's going to have the necessary ingredients for the bees to make their own queen. Given either half could end up with or without the queen. Both halves need to have food. They need to have sufficient bees and they need to have that young brood, the eggs. Um, in the second method, that would, you know, you might have three or four boxes, but you would do the same thing. Um, eight frame versus 10 frame, you would be pulling four from each box into each, but it would still end up with the same three higher, four higher arrangement. Um, but again, it, the, the key is that the bees will work it out in the space if you give them the necessary ingredients to, to produce their own queen. One of them is going to need to do that. Yeah, I think that's really the main point is that the bees will sort it out. The other thing is that you can always come back and rearrange things um, and change things around later as long as they at least can, can get green right. Um, there, there's a question on the easiest split. Um, do you have to move half of them? Do you have to move both of them to new hives or can you leave one in the, the same equipment in the same location? Um, and I, I think we just showed it that you can move it to new equipment just for the period of, it's really hard to make animations in, um, Google slides, but yeah, you can, you can use the original boxes as well. Right you could go through and pull out one, three, five, seven, nine, and move them over and then tighten up the remaining ones and put the frames on them. Yes, you, you certainly could do that. Yep. Yep. And then someone said that they felt like they could hear after a couple hours that one is going to buzz louder and that will be the queenless one. Um, Cause we had talked about checking after a couple of days. Yeah. So beekeepers do talk about a queenless sort of roar. Um, you'll catch that if you pop the lid on a colony sometimes. I'm not, I'm not aware that it would happen in a matter of a couple hours. I would say it wouldn't be a reliable way to check and know if, which colony is queenless. So it's interesting. You might be right when you hear that roar. It might be a queenless colony, but I wouldn't use that as your method of deciding which colony has a queen or not. I agree with that. Um, and then the last one, Barry wants to know, when you split a hive, how do you ensure that a sufficient number of workers will stay with the new hive? Yeah, so some of that is going to be the, when you, you're moving these frames, you want to, you, you want to be careful not to bump them so the bees that are covering them, um, you know, stay on those frames. And then it, some of it comes down to the aspect of the field bees and that, that gets into where the positioning, if you kind of move each colony halfway from the parent colony or split that, that position, they should each get some of those field bees. Um, so you, you don't want to get, if you get into a uh, situation where you leave one in that place, that's going to get all the field bees and the other one's gonna get none, and that one may be a little deficient in bees. If you were gonna do that, you wanna give that one that's not gonna have any field bees a few extra bees relative to brood, accounting for that drift back to the, the original location. All right, um, without knowing which hive has the queen, doesn't moving frames involve the risk of smushing being the technical term here yeah. so I, th I think a short answer yes but bear in mind anytime you're in the colony there's a chance your queen can get damaged um so so that i think that just highlights the need to work you know slowly carefully start by pulling an outside frame where she's not likely to be and then you can then you're easier to open up some space and get out other frames um so yeah, it's, it's just something you always want to be in mind. You shouldn't be afraid to get in your hive for fear of damaging the queen. You should, you should learn how to appropriately work in the hive and to very minimally have a risk of, of damaging bees in the queen. 
Excellent. Um, and then there's a question, and, and if you're not familiar with this system, I can answer it. It says, any comments, comments on the OTS or on the spot queen rearing method of helping start the queen cells by hitting cells with a paper clip to elongate the ones that have fresh eggs? Why don't you go ahead? I'm not overly familiar with that. Yeah, so the, the OTS method, um, which is a, a lovely system that um, you can purchase the book from Mel and, and learn a lot more about, but basically it's letting the bees raise their own queen. Um, one thing that he um, proposes is that you actually pick which queens or which cells are going to develop into queens, so he damages the bottom of the cell. Um, that is a way that you can do. It's definitely not necessary. The bees will pick bees or will pick um, larvae of the correct age in order to make more cells. So you don't have to notch the cells, um, that's another term for that, in order to have them make queen cells. They'll do it just fine if you just leave it. And then um, if you're splitting a hive and moving one farther away to like a different yard or city, should you wait a few days after splitting before actually relocating for the field bees? So I would generally be inclined to move it right away by, by leaving it in that yard that they're going to drift back to the original location. Whereas if, if you make your split and move it out, you kind of know what you took with you and there's not going to be any you know, provided you go far enough, more than a mile or two, they're, they're not going to drift back to that original location. So you've got a more defined unit that you're, you've got an appropriate beat to brood ratio. Excellent. Um, we had a question on, just one second to bring it up, on how long can a colony be queenless during the split process before they actually start raising their own queen and won't accept another queen? Yeah, so they're, they're going to start within a matter of a couple days. I mean, they say when we remove that queen, they're going to start building queen cells um, within a couple days while they've still got that, you know, just, just emerged from an egg, first entire larvae. Once that window closes, they can't. So they're going to start raising them pretty soon. Um, they can certainly be queenless for a few days, possibly longer, but I think it's, it's best to get, I like to introduce that queen essentially as soon as possible. Um, just feel acceptance is better. Maybe others have thoughts on that, um, but yeah, I, I tend not to want to delay too long. I would say that the issue in, I usually give them a day, um, but the issue in waiting too long is once they start raising those queen cells, um, a lot of times they won't they won't stop them. And so when you're introducing a new queen, if they've already started queen cells, you can introduce her, she gets accepted, a new virgin hatches out, kills her, and then you basically lost that queen. Um, so it would be useful to go through and make sure you tear down any queen cells when you, re re when you release her. That would be the only thing that I think would affect the timing. All right, and then the last question I have is, um, for these easy splits, do you have suggestions of the time of days to do these splits? Um, I don't think it particularly matters. Um, yeah, I, a comfortable working temperature, you know, and a nice time of day, you want to do it, um, you know, when actually getting in and manipulating brood is not going to be an issue um, but I, I don't think you know mid-morning to late afternoon I think should be fine. I would I would agree with that the big thing is any time for any of the splits that you're doing we're only doing this on nice days because we don't want to chill the brood. All right so for our next one, we're going to talk about a couple versions of splits um, where we have a little more control. So the idea with these first ones is that you should basically have no reason to, to not do these. These are really, 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 really simple ones. And, you know, the idea that we want to promote is that 
every beekeeper with a large colony is going to have to do swarm control. And I talk to a lot of beekeepers that say, well, like, I think that splits are an advanced technique and I'm just going to let my bees swarm because I'm not comfortable. And so these are ones that everybody should be able to do. Like small children can do these types of splits. So you should be comfortable in at least trying them out um, as a way to learn how to do splits. Now we're going to go into some that are a little more advanced. Um, and th the benefits of these is that it gives you a little more control over the situation. And it gives you a little more options and a little more nuance. So the one is, is literally called um, a dirty split because it really is just getting the job done. And now these will give you um, some kind of more finesse and fancier ways to do it. Okay, so with these, um, you do have to find the queen. Um, that is one of the ways that you have a lot more control is knowing which one has the queen and which one doesn't have the queen. And there's a couple versions to do that. So the first version is you just take your time and you look for her and you tear the hive apart and you set it in a couple stacks and you just look for her. The second option is um, you just take the queen and you, or you take your hive, you take off a couple boxes. So if you've got two deeps, you put this in between the two deeps. If you've got four mediums, you'd maybe put it in between, you know, numbers two and three. You add a queen excluder, you come back in two days or in four days, and one section is gonna have eggs. The other section is not gonna have eggs. The one with the eggs has the queen. And there, voila, you know where the queen is. The third option is the one that I do, is I confine her to the bottom box. And the process is what you can actually see here, is you're shaking the bees off. And so you take all the boxes off, you shake all the bees, you can keep clicking through this, um, you shake all the bees into the bottom box, you put a queen excluder on, and then you restack the hive. And you can use an empty box as a funnel so that you can shake the bees down in there. And this one I really like because it's very, very fast. You get all the bees to the bottom and then they can kind of sort themselves out and redistribute um, themselves as they think is appropriate. All right, so one method that is really easy to do um, as a method of swarm management is to remove the queen into a nuke. And what we're doing in this process is we're making up a nuke with a few frames of brood, a few frames of honey, and the old queen. It doesn't have to be in like a five frame nuke box. One of the easiest ways to do this would just be to do it in, you know, two eight frame mediums if that's what you're using or a single deep. And then you're allowing the colony to requeen itself or you can add a queen cell. It's kind of hard to add a mated queen to the big colony. Um, because you'll just have a lot of bees and a lot of the old bees will be there and they won't want to accept her. So you can see I'm coming in the yard, I bring in a new box with deeps or with some two frames of brood and I add the queen. You always want to add at least a couple frames of brood just so that the bees will stay with her and will take care of her. And then that will get a lid in the bottom board and the old hive will requeen itself. Now, if the old kind hive doesn't requeen itself, you should quit beekeeping because you failed at making splits. No, I'm just kidding. If you click forward, you'll see an animation where you basically just do a newspaper combine. So remember, as Dan talked through the queen reign process, it does take a long time and you do have to be super patient and you do have to take good notes. So you need to write down when you would expect to actually see larva and go through that queen rearing calendar and figure it out because you, and then right on the top of the box, Megan, don't go digging in here until this particular date because you're gonna wanna dig in there earlier and the only thing you can do is mess it up. But sometimes it doesn't work. The queen goes off, she gets eaten by a dragonfly on her mating flight, she doesn't come back, in which case you just recombine and you've missed that reproductive swarm window. And you've, so your colony is no longer going to have that really strong urge to swarm and you can go right into making honey. Um, there is a question that says, I'm gonna give a friend a split from one of my overwintered hives. Should I send the queen with the friend or keep, keep the queen and let the friend have a queenless nuke? Um, 
you can, so this is one of the benefits of having a young queen in the fall is that you could in good conscience sell a young queen with that nuke. Um, but it is nice to keep her on hand until your colony does requeen itself. Another option is that you could pull that nuke out, put, um, as Adam was mentioning, pulling brood out and have a new queen in there, which you could purchase a new queen and sell it. So it's it's nice to keep at least having the queen on hand until that colony requeens. Um, but you you can actually take that nuke and sell her. All right, so the next method I'm going to talk to you is a modified Demaray method, and I'm going to go through it pretty quickly for the sake of time, and then just because there's some other questions we want to get to as well. Um, this is the method that I've been using, and I call it a perfectly fine method of splitting for swarm control, and just because it is a good method, it is not the only method. You can do whatever method you want. The reason that I like this method is you do know where the queen is. So I don't have to go back and, and dig in there and try to find her. I, I can hit the ground running um, once I'm done with my splits. The other thing I like about it is you can spread it out over multiple days. So some of the process you can do on those nice sunny days, but you can actually get a lot of work done um, during bad weather as well or during the early morning, which kind of allows you to maximize the sunny days for the times when you're digging in the brood nest and it's more fragile. It also allows you time to plan um, so that you can kind of set up what you need to do and then come back to your, get all your equipment ready and come back to the bee yard. And we all know that like when we're hurried, we make really poor decisions. All right, so the step one, which I mentioned in the swarm prevention, is in the early spring, we add a box of drawn comb, which you should be able to see. And here I'm giving the example of a deep, because that's what I do, because it's easier to make splits, but you could also do mediums in this context. And then step two is we're gonna actually make the split. So this is when we're ready when we're seeing backfilling, we've got this warmer weather, we see full frames of brood, I'm gonna bring with me to the bee yard the following list. So a completely empty box with no frames, which is my funnel for shaking bees, a queen excluder, a box with mostly drawn comb, all drawn comb if you have it. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna disassemble the hive completely, and then you're gonna reconfigure it in the following orientation. So you're gonna have the queen on the bottom, and then she'll have drawn comb, so she has space to lay. There's a queen excluder above her, your box of empty comb, which you already have on there, which is either your deeps or your mediums. And then all of your brood is gonna go way above that. And you'll see that on the next slide. Hopefully. All right, so in the original location, I've got the box where the queen is gonna go, and I've got two frames of brood down there for her. So she's got some friends. And I shake all the bees down there, and I give her a little food, so usually it's like a frame of honey on each side. And then, so she's got two frames of brood, honey on the outside, and then a bunch of drawn comb for her to lay in. Then I add the queen excluder, and then I add another empty box. So this position, those light green boxes that you see at the bottom um, are the ones that the queen is going to stay in. That's gonna be the hive that lives in the original location. Then the top boxes, I'm going to make into my splits. So in this example, I had eight frames of brood. So I left two frames of brood down with the queen and that's just so some bees stay down there. And then I made two nukes which are in, um, here I'm using all deeps, but you can do this again, you can do this totally with mediums. And each one of those has three frames of brood. Now I maybe don't wanna make nukes and I could just make, you know, I could leave three frames of brood with the queen and leave, you know, five frames in a really big split for my bees. So you, you do have options. But in this configuration, so once I put them in this configuration and I do this on a nice day, now they are no longer going to swarm. So the, this queen is down below. She has much, much, much room to put it in, um, to, put, to lay eggs in. And then above this queen excluder, they have plenty of room to put away nectar. So that has taken away that entire impetus to swarm. Above this is going to be um, the splits. So I need to come back and do something with this brood nest um, 
at le the earliest I can do it is that night because I want the bees again to redistribute. The latest is, you know, I have to make sure that they don't have emergency kill, um, queen cells emerge from that top part. So I've got some options I can do at this point. So option one is I just take those top boxes as one split or one heavy split or two light splits and I give them queen cells or mated queens. Option two is I let them raise queen cells, but then I'm gonna move the splits before they emerge. And the reason that I'm doing this while they're still on this big hive is because I want them to have all of those resources of the big hive. They're also gonna have all the nurse bees of that big hive. Option three is I can come back and kill the queen cells and let the colony recombine. That has the benefit of getting me through, again, we're talking about this reproductive swarm season, and I can get through the reproductive swarm season. There's a couple downsides to this. One is that you're going to have a huge brood nest. You never get a break in the brood cycle, which means that you're not getting a, um, your splits are not helping for varroa control. And for all of us that is a big huge deal and the more varroa control that we can do especially these versions that um, don't require the use of chemicals are really really useful the second thing is that it just may not be enough we have a huge nectar flow and this um, configuration does buy you some time but you are going to have a ton of food coming in and especially if you've got a ton of food left in the hive it may not be um, sufficient all right, so then, then either the, that evening, um, or so later in the evening, or during the day, you can remove the splits. If you move them in the daytime, um, then all of the field bees stay with the original hive. And this is if you move them to another yard. Um, and that original hive stays really big and can make a ton of honey. And those two nukes that you take, or the one split that you take, has only young bees, which means that it's really good for introducing new queens because they're going to be really nice to her. If you move it at night or early in the morning or on a really, really cold day, the nice thing about doing that method is that your bees are going to decide how many bees are necessary for covering that brood. So when you take that box away, the bees have put in enough of them to actually give it full coverage. Again, if you move it at night and then you let the bees warm up in the daytime, a lot of them are going to go back to the original location. So if you're doing the nighttime move, you have to move them to a different yard. All right, so this is an example of what I've been doing this process for just the last couple of years, but I've really liked it. So this is an example of in my um, yards, you can see the three hives in the background. And those are the three hives I'm leaving in that location. Um, so I'm leaving the original queen there. And you can see they have a medium underneath and then a deep. So that's the brood nest. And then the honey super is going on top. So I move the other hives, but you don't have to, but you just have to keep in mind that they'll be smaller. I gave queen cells to these three little boxes that are in the front, um, but you could have added mated queens to those that you can purchase. And you can see that it's just really cold, garbagey weather on the day that I moved them. Um, and so that way I um, have more bees in these because I was using them for increases. But if I moved them on a nice sunny day, they're just going to be a little bit smaller. All right. So after swarm season, that's when our bees are going to start superseding. So if you don't have young queens, you're often going to um, lose a queen at that point. The bees will naturally do it. This is also the time of year that they can lay off on the nurse um, nursing duties and are going to go into drawing out wax. And then it is important. So we have this reproductive swarm season where the bees really, really want to swarm, but then um, there's always a chance that they can swarm throughout the season. So anytime that you force the bees to backfill because you're not on top of it with the ne nectar, then the bees can absolutely swarm. So here's a photo of a colony and you can see the honey and the burr comb on top of those frames. That beekeeper did not stay ahead putting comb on. And so when we have these big colonies, we want to super often. And putting two boxes on at a time is not a big deal. Now for small colonies, we want to be a little more thrifty, but big colonies during the period of growth, which is what spring is, if we want to make sure that they have plenty of room. So two supers at a time is totally reasonable. 
All right, so the main points about swarming. Your big colonies with old queens will swarm. That is absolutely your job. You can tell when it's going to get close by watching the brood nest, which you'll start to see backfilling. You'll start to see full frames of brood. You can slow this process down by giving them room above the brood nest. This is super and buys you a little time. And then you can control swarming by splitting or removing brood. In every single split that you have, the queen is going to need to have ample room to lay. That is what's going to drop it off. All right, so we've got a couple questions here, and then um, I'm sure Adam has a couple coming in off of Facebook. So there's a couple that I've gotten about people who don't want to have any more hives, which I understand that there are people who can have good boundaries with the number of colonies they have, and I do applaud you for your restraint. Um, so if, let's say you have six hives and you just don't want to have more hives, what do you do? Um, this is one of the main reasons that it's super important to be part of a beekeeping community. Right now we have a ridiculous system where we literally have people with excess bees who do not share their bees and they make their neighbors get their bees from California or Georgia. Ideally, what you're going to do is make your splits and then make those bees available to people in your community. And if you don't wanna be a bee seller, you can contact a person who's already selling nukes or you can contact your bee club. I'm sure that you can sell a local overwintered nuke in about 0.1 seconds at your bee club. Um, there's a huge demand for local bees and it is really a shame that people would rather hoard them or let them die in the trees, then make them available to their neighbors. So you can buy some cardboard nuke boxes. Um, you can purchase queens. So someone also asked about how we have queens early in the season. Um, we can't get queens, for local queens, usually at the time that we need to make splits because most queen producers start when the bees want to drive their queens or when the, the bees want to start making queens. Um, but you can purchase queens. It's, it's a much lesser impact of purchasing queens from a warmer area in order to make a lot of splits. Or a lot of times you may be able to get queen cells from a local producer and allow those nukes. So buy some cardboard boxes um, or some nuke boxes and get some queen cells or mated queens and make those bees available. There are a couple of methods, like I said, with the modified Demaray, you can um, allow the bees to recombine, but if you don't make those splits, sometimes you do end up eventually having to make a split. There's other methods where you can allow them to slowly recombine, such as using a Snellgrove board, um, but, but again, it's going to push them um, really, really far. Um, do, 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 do. When I make splits and I see the queen, should they give less bees to where the queen actually is? Um, the, there will be more bees that will come to where the queen is, but it won't be as strong of a drive um, as it will be for where the old location is. And again, you can make the splits and then you can always rearrange. So if you wanted to um, make your hives more even, after you do all the splits, so everybody's queen right, you can always take a frame of capped brood and move it to another hive, or you can do that little trick where you switch locations, and you can always equalize your colonies afterwards. Um, what we really want to do is, I, I usually view it as these little windows. So we have these windows of trying to get through splits and swarm season, and then we can equalize so that we're making honey. Um, Adam, do you have any questions coming in off of Facebook? I do not right now. Okay, then I will, so there's a question about, are there any other times or dates after splits that we should check or do anything? Um, I'm going to say, well, yes, overall, many things. But I usually, I would say the important thing is to make sure that everybody is queen right and has lots of space before honey comes in. For us in Michigan, we're going to enter our honey flow really, really, really quickly. And so um, like we go from swarms 
into honey flow. And so we want one of the most important things we can do is make sure everybody is ready to make lots of honey so they're queen right and they have lots of space. Um, someone says that they have two average size colonies who are at the top of their hives. Should they add one super? I'm actually adding two to my colonies when I'm going out to supering. And that's one reason is because I get it out of my garage. The other reason is it does allow the bees to kind of clean it out and get it ready. But also we can fill up supers really, really, really quickly. Um, the question about putting supers early on strong hives, what about average to small hives? I'm gonna direct you to our last webinar, which the recording should be up. That was the one from last week where we talked to do about what to do with both dead outs and small hives. Um, if you give a frame of brood from one to another, do you need to shake the bees off? Or are they okay to go into another hive without fighting? Bees, especially the ones that are on brood frames, are very, very nice to each other. Those are young bees, um, and those are going to be very, very giving and accepting of each other. All right, I'm gonna just check a couple more. Um, actually, Honor Dan, do you wanna do this one while I look at the rest of them? It says, sure. how should I time mite treatments with splitting? Should I worry about doing it before or should wait, just wait until the splits are done? So if you want to talk Dave through some of the options. Yeah, sure. So I think um, either option is fine. We do know that it can be really good to do an early spring mite treatment to keep your mites under control. Um, so one thing would be if you you can do it before or you can do it after. It might depend on what treatment you're interested in using because some of them have restrictions for the size of the colony or if there's honey supers on or temperature restrictions. So you want to look at all of those things and read the label but I would say either option is fine as long as you're considering mite management throughout the season. Excellent, all right. Um, I just wanna thank everybody for your attention tonight. It really is a thrill for us to see how many people take all of their time out of their evenings to learn more about bees. Um, the best thing that you can do for your bees is to keep learning how to take care of them. All right, good night, everyone.